Hello and welcome to today's Craftsy Chats. My name is Leah and before we really get into all of your questions, just a few reminders for me to get us started. So I'm going to bring on today's guest and introduce her. You can see her. She can give a quick wave in just a moment. But before we officially introduce her, I want to let you all know a couple reminders. One, we're here for your questions. So I want to draw your attention to the chat box. There are a couple questions that are already in there. We've got some of you already excited to get your questions answered, and we would love to get to as many as possible in the time we have today. So when you have a question, just drop it right on into the chat box, and we'll get to as many as we can. I also like to see where everybody is watching from, so you can just test it out right now, even if you don't have a question yet, by saying hello and letting us know where it is that you're joining us from. Now, the other reminder that I have for you is a little link that I'd love for you to follow if you get a chance. It is to our Cozy Craft Along, and that link is going to appear in the chat box that I just mentioned. So the Cozy Craft Along was a five-day mini-series. There were five crafts. Those are five free patterns for you to experiment with, play around with, and put your own stamp on. All of those patterns are available for you, as well as all of our tutorials for those patterns as well. So you can go back and watch those videos. We had a ton of fun with Winter Crafts. And again, that link is going to be dropped into the chat box, our cozy craft along. Now with that out of the way, it is time, I promise, we're going to bring on today's guest. So today we have with us Natalie, Natalie O'Shea. I'm going to introduce you and then send it on over to you to tell us all about you, a little background, what crafting have you done, and just basically how your day is going so far. Start us off. Hello, everybody. I'm Natalie O'Shea, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, you'll probably notice from the accent, I'm originally from Ireland. I came to the United States uh, 17 years ago. I followed my husband, who was in the army, and seeing as he couldn't come to Ireland, I had to come to the US, and I have been here since. I have been involved in crafting for many years. Um, I used to own a yarn company called the Yarn Sisters, and we sold the company back in, um, oh goodness, 2019. But I've still kept on my knitting and crochet, and I also do many other things. I paint, I make jewelry, I do silver metal clay, I, gosh, a bit of everything, really. Uh, I love trying new things. So when I see something on Craftsy that I've never done, I'm really excited and I'm like, I gun ho, I have to go and try that. And um, so I am absolutely, as I said, ah, somebody from New Zealand, kia ora. <laughs> and I, um, that's where we used to source our yarn and our, where the yarn was manufactured for the Yarn Sisters was in New Zealand. So my, I've, my heart, I have a big pl fond place for New Zealand. And um, lately now I have, this is my first Q&A and my first time on Craftsy Live. And um, I'm here to answer your questions. All right. Well, we are not just from New Zealand. We have some viewers from Canada, a bunch of states in the United States as well. Uh, so we've got viewers from everywhere. And I'm wondering, before we dig into questions, if you'd like to talk a little bit about what you'll be doing with Craftsy tomorrow for any of our Spanish speakers that might be watching today. Yes. Tomorrow we are launching the first Craftsy en Español. Yes. So tomorrow will be our first uh, first edition of chats in uh, with Craftsy in Spanish, and uh, we are going to be speaking with Evie, who will be talking about and answering your questions about sewing, and it's Ooh. very exciting. And the uh, whole uh, event, the one-hour event, will be held in Spanish and only in Spanish. Ooh, that is really fantastic and very exciting. So I'm glad that you'll be doing that tomorrow, but today you get to answer all of the questions. So we're going to get started with Annie's question first, um, and we'll get to as many as we have time for. So let's go with Annie, and Annie wants to know, what are some ways to deal with twisty yarn? I crochet, knit, continental machine knit, and some yarns I have to untwist every few inches, others not so much. Is it all about the Z or the S twist or how it's wound from a hank? 
the direction I am wrapping the yarn around my needle or the hook, can it be resolved by rewinding it multiple times? What do you think about something like that? She is correct. It is about the S and Z twist. <laughs> Most of the yarns that we have here um, in the United States are Z twist. Um, let me see if I have a yarn where there are several plies and they twist. And when you look at the yarn itself, you will see a Z, the Z, the the bar of the Z. And that is what you how you recognize a Z yarn. The Z yarn gives you a nice even gauge. So when you do a sample or a swatch, you get a very even. Uh, it's probably a bit dark, but you get a very even V. When you use yarn that hasn't been that is an S um, spin, you get a, a V where you might get one line that is more pronounced. So sometimes it looks like you can't, that, you're, that your tension is off. But in fact, it's not your tension. It's your, it's the yarn itself because it's been spun a different way. Um, in, in, as I said, in the mass market, you generally find yarn that's Z um, spun. S yarn um, is, I think, more of the uh, the fancy yarns. So you might have, you know, the, the yarns with bobbles or with a bit of roving in them, a bit of felt in them. Some of those are um, the ones that would be spun in the S. Um, and this is a very broad, simple overview, but I don't want to take up too much time. And, and I do know that there are um, a lot of, there's a lot of information out there on the different types of, of yarn and, and how, it, how they're spun. So um, I would suggest doing a quick search and, and you'll get a much more in-depth um, response to that question. Absolutely. And I also do like to point out as we're chatting through and Natalie's answering your questions, if you have encountered any of the situations that our viewers are asking about and you have a suggestion, drop that into the chat box as well. We always love crowdsourcing. It's always a fun time and it makes the community feel just a little bit more interactive, especially with people joining from literally all over the globe. We've got a hello from Vicky in Australia. Uh, oh. So all the way from New Zealand to Canada to London. Iowa in the middle of the United States. So tons of people viewing right now. Love it. Uh, we're going to do Patty's question next. And okay. Patty wants to know what is the best stitch for stitching the components of a sweater when you finish the knitting? Mattress. Um, do you mean um, it's piecing the garment together? Uh, Patty, I'm going to keep an eye out if you want to clarify that. It seems to me that she's just asking when you finish the knitting component and you've got to seam it, so any pieces that are not connected. The, the mattress stitch would be the best. All right. And Patty, like I said, if you want any more clarification, drop that in and we'll revisit this in a moment you, if you need more. You can also um, pick up the stitches and, and knit them, bind them off together, pick up the stitches on both, but that's a bit more complicated. The, the mattress stitch is really the, the, the easiest and, and it's pretty seamless. All right, let's move to crochet with our next question. And this is from Marilyn. So Marilyn says, I cannot get the height of my crochet stitches to gauge. And if I switch hook size, row stitches go too many. The magic loop, the yarn over part of this stitch is always challenging and loose, even when keeping excessive tension on the yarn. It's so frustrating. What can you say to help Marilyn and anybody else struggling with this out? That's a very common um, problem. And um, I think for me personally, I really, really pay attention to the, when you're doing the yarn over, let's say for a half double crochet, um, I really pay attention to that yarn over. I, quite frankly, I nearly overcompensate on the tension because once you finish through with the stitch, 
it'll even out. Not only that, if you're going to block and then you wet block, everything evens out. So um, let me see. I have... I'll give an example of... Well, we just got a taste of your background. It's very festive and lit behind you. <laughs> yes, it is. I've got all my my bits and pieces, and my my youngest likes to, um, shall we say, go overboard. Is not the probably the word I would use, but he loves Christmas. So we have decorations everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to. Let's say we have So when you're doing the yarn over and let me just my camera There we go. Yes. Yeah. Here so you're doing the yarn over you go in and you take it, and this is, I'm doing a half double. I. Can you lift up just here? a little more? There. Is that better? Yes. Or maybe, let me see. That's probably better. When I'm at this stage, I really, I close the stitch onto the needle, onto the hook like this. Then I do yarn over go into the next, pull it through, and it seems a little bit tight. But when you finish the stitch, you'll find that you don't have the loose bit here at the top. And I think that's what you're talking about. It's this part at the top. So tighten it as much as possible. And you can always, until you get into a rhythm, you can always go back and adjust the stitches a little bit in the previous in the previous one. So here I did one without, I'll do a couple, without tightening. And you can see there's a big, oh, there's a big difference between the two I just did without watching my tension and the one before that, that is nicely done, if you see what I mean. And that's why you're getting problems with your height tension. All right, hopefully that is helpful, not just for Marilyn, but anybody else struggling with that stitch. Uh, always let us know if you would like more clarification as well. Uh, we're going to Barbara's question next. Uh, and Barbara wants to know, what is the easiest way to do join as you go granny squares? Join as you go. Oh, it, it depends on the pattern. It really does depend on the pattern. Um, if you're doing square ones, you can continue on and redo this the 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 pattern it's how can i explain um it's it takes a lot of math because you have to kind of figure out which way you're going to go because if you just continue making a square or a circle you'll end up in the middle and you're going to have to break the yarn. So if you don't want to break the yarn, um, you can continue like this in this direction, or there's another way you can cut the yarn and pick up on the following square and continue and redo the pattern. It's without having a pattern to actually show it's hard to explain. I personally um, don't, I'm not a great fan of, of that method simply because I always like to, to arrange my granny squares at the end so I can get the visual, the color. 
and the visual pattern tip top. But most, if, if you want to do a pattern that is um, join as you go, you can actually search for that specific um, method and they, and lots of patterns will come up. And in those patterns, they usually explain very well how to do the join as you go. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple clarifications that have just dropped in, by the way. So I want to revisit some of what we've just chatted about. So first of all, Patty, yes, Patty was talking about piecing together. So that mattress stitch that you suggested seems to be exactly the answer that Patty was looking for. Um, and then Annie wanted to revisit back to, this is about the twisted yarn. Um, Annie wants to know, how do you deal with the twist? So how would you manage it? You have to live with it, really. <laughs> um, and, and I know that sounds a bit harsh, but, um, you know, for instance, if you were doing some and you decided you wanted to do a hat and you had different types of twists in the hat, if you were using an S twist, when you do the color work, it would kind of disappear because of the type of twist. So when you purchase yarn, or I'm the sort of person who buys yarn and then decides on the project because I just have a love for fiber. <laughs> so if I, if I see yarn that I love, I just buy it and then I decide what sort of a pattern I will make. Um, however, if you have a specific pattern where the gauge or the, you know, the, the let's say you had something like this, which is just a little mitten, and you're really concerned about having a perfect even tension, then the S twist would not be a choice because there really isn't, apart from I'm trying to think, if you were to, to if you had two fingering S twist yarns, you could join them together and it would be less visible to make maybe a double double knit so if you had two fingering and you took from either end of the of the ball of yarn and you were going to knit from either end so basically holding the two together like and that would create probably more or less a dk or a heavy sport, then the S twist will not be as visible. But if if it's something that does bother you, unfortunately, you need to go with a different yarn. It's the way it's spun in in when it's made. And so the S twist with the Z twist, the yarn is carded. I mean, is, is worse, so it's straight. The, the, the fibers are pulled straight. So you get a nice straight fiber and fibers are about six inches long. So when they're pulled together and when you take it to go and spin it, it spins really nicely. However, with the in order to create the S-weight yarn, it's carded. So it's the yarn is all mixed up and goes in all different ways. And that's why when it's spun, it doesn't give you as nice a finish. Um, blocking does help, wet blocking does help, but you still will be able to see that V that goes like this. So you'll have a more prominent line um, on one side. Uh, twisting and retwisting and, and unwinding and unwinding, to, in my experience, has not been um, something that I'm successful, that I was successful with. Okay. Uh, and, you mentioned, go ahead. And so that's why it's important to, to know uh, uh, what type of yarn um, it is before you attempt a project. Because if you were to attempt a project with S type yarn and you were doing color work, as I said, it wouldn't come out as well because 
you would have one color, one part of the, of the stitch that would be more prominent than the other, and it would kind of be more faded, which also actually gives a really nice effect. And if that's what you're looking for, a more kind of artisanal effect, then that's perfect. But if you're looking for some nice stranded Scandinavian work, then there's nothing much you can really do. All right. Well, you mentioned blocking a couple times uh, mm -hmm. when talking about this. And our next question is about that. So Jody wants to know if blocking is really that necessary. Jody's only making household items and has not gotten into garments yet. So if that affects your answer, that's a little detail in there. So if you're making dishcloths, no. No. Um, it's, it's not necessary. Um, however, and it also depends on what type of fiber. Some fibers are better suited to blocking um, than others. Now, household items, um, let me think. Are we talking, dish, if I could have a bit more information about the household, household items, I can maybe give a, a more in-depth answer. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I'll just add on. I know we frequently have some beginners that join for these Craftsy Chats. So would you be able to describe blocking a little bit for them and what it is used for? So when is it important to block? I will tell you that I block everything huh? except my scrubbies <laughs> <laughs> and, and my, my dish towels, my, my little cotton squares that I make, my... But everything else I block. Um, blocking hides a lot. And in fact, I can show you what blocking does. These are exactly the, the same two patterns. So this is the unblocked hat. Mm -hmm. This is the blocked hat. Ah. So what blocking does is it releases the fibers. So I, I'm, I'm very much a, a proponent of wet blocking and I'm, and I mean, immersive blocking, unless we're dealing with natural hand dyes that may, um, if I have done a color work pattern and they may bleed, then I will just steam but 95% of the time I do wet blocking. I mean, I immerse it and I use um, a product um, that is specifically for knitted items. Um, and what I do is I put it in like a product like soak and then I put the item and I let it soak <laughs> for 20 minutes or so. And, and the beauty of, of doing that, it also, when you're knitting, you know, you're releasing a lot of oils from your hands and your hands aren't always the cleanest. I mean, I walk around with knitting in my, in my purse and wherever I am, I pick up my knitting and I'll be very honest. I do not disinfect my hands every time before I start knitting. So the wet blocking and using a product um, that is specifically made for yarn where you immerse the yarn and it will also disinfect and protect the yarn and make your your garment last longer so it it you and most of these products are you don't rinse them so they they really nourish the fibers and they help the fibers expand and so you'll see that your tension will even out you'll have a much more even um item and it just looks nicer and i also if i keep very few things i gift things so i like to have them clean before i gift them <laughs> so uh one one of the of the types of yarn that doesn't really block that well are 100 synthetic yarns um and and those i don't really block them. Most of them are machine washable. I just throw them into the machine at, on a cold cycle and watch them and then pin them to shape. And that's, that's what I do. 
All right, well, we're gonna stay with knitting for our next question. Uh, this comes from Tyson. Uh, Tyson says, hi, Natalie, I have a question. Hi. Do you have any tips for designing knitwear? Designing knitwear, it's actually easier Ah. than most people think it is. Um, I would start with some very basic patterns. So I would start I, with a hat. A hat can be modified into so many different designs depending on what pattern you use. And one of the, the most wonderful books or series of books out there, Barbara Walker's, has so many different stitch patterns um, that you can choose. And when you do a hat, uh, I like to do them in the round because I don't like, when I finish knitting, I don't like putting things, seaming things. <laughs> but once you understand the principle of gauge, which is one of the most important things when it comes to designing, is gauge measuring so if you were at measuring the head knowing the different head sizes doing swatches of your of the yarn that you would like to use making sure that the gauge so let's say if you wanted to make a hat and let's um most heads are between 20 and 22 inches and you wanted to do four stitch and you did it took the gauge on the yarn from doing a sample swatch like this. You would measure how many stitches per inches, both horizontally and vertically. And for the circumference, you would do 20, let's say you were doing a hat that was 20 inches for a small head, <laughs> 20 inches. You would multiply 20 by four four stitches per inch, which would give you 80. Then you would cast on 80 stitches. And that would give you the circumference, the number of stitches to knit the hat. Then um, I also, when you go to start narrowing down to make the crown, uh, you can divide and have 80. Then an easy one would be, you know, to put eight decreases so you would then divide 80 by eight so every 10 stitches you would have a decrease and so you would do one row of decreases every 10 stitches then do one row without decreases next row the same one thing you have to remember though the more decreases that you put in so let's say if you made a hat that had eight decreases on the crown um let me see if there's so here whoops i'm trying to get used to this so if you see the decreases here so you could have eight you could have five you could have six um you want to make sure that it's going to sit nicely on top you could do three but they would have to be nicely evenly spaced um the more you put, the more decreases you put, so let's say when you have eight as opposed to five, you're going to reach the end of your stitches much more quickly, which means you're going to have to have a higher, a longer body, this part here, before you start decreasing for the top. But if you had, let's say, five, you could start decreasing here as opposed to starting decreasing here. So the more decrease intervals you have, the shorter the crown will be. And you will need the main part of the hat to be longer. Right. For anybody that is designing their knitwear, I hope that is helpful. Thank you for that question, Tyson. Um, so we're going to go for the next couple. 
revisit and kind of wrap up some of the items we started out with, and then we'll move into a different direction away from knitting for a moment. But first, let's wrap up. We've got some clarifications to get through here. Uh, so going back to the joining granny squares that Barbara had asked about earlier. Um, so with all of what you mentioned in mind with that answer, Barbara wants to know what would be the best method for joining the granny square. So what kind of patterns should you be looking for if you're wanting to really get that best method in? Do you have a suggestion? Um, a great way is just Googling. Okay. Um, you could do um, granny square pattern, um, joining squares as you go. And you will definitely get some patterns that way. I, as I said, like to put them out. And then I just crochet them. I, I put them together using either a slip stitch or a single crochet. Or sometimes I might even, if I want to have a more lofty, um, if I'm making a shawl, I might go with the treble crochet to join them. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a more lofty um, join. All right. Maybe this would be a good one to crowdsource in the comments as well. Anybody that has experience with those the joining the granny squares, uh, go ahead and drop that in the comments so that Barbara and anybody else interested can kind of see the trial and error of people in the community as well. Um, let's also go back to the twisted yarn that we were talking about with Annie. Mm -hmm. uh, so Annie is pretty pleased with the projects. So when you were talking about how the projects were turning out, Annie's pretty okay with that. She's talking about dealing with the twist before it gets to her needle. So do you have anything to add about that particular point? Before it gets to the needle. Mm -hmm. It also that it could be something very simple. It could be whether it's being the yarn is being pulled from the center of the of the yarn of this of the ball or from the outside. That can make a difference too. Ah. Also, um, if you're left-handed or right-handed, when you're spinning or when you're taking a skein and putting it in to a, um, a bun, I call them buns. I know here in, in the States they're called something else, but I call them a bun. Um, depending on whether you're doing it right-handed or left-handed, that could have a huge impact too. Okay, so just trying out different ways to approach that, I guess, would be your suggestion. Yes, then? And, and whether, I mean, you can also, grab the yarn a different way so you could grab the yarn and twist it if you're a continental knitter that could be a bit easier mm -hmm. so let's say um i'm trying to think of how to explain this you would pluck the yarn in the reverse so when we when when we knit here we go under over but here you would do over under and that can help with the twist as well um another thing is i find that when i when my yarn loses its twist so when when this happens so mm. that it kind of becomes loose like that I take the ball of yarn and I roll it up whoops and I just let it fall and realign itself mm. and then wind it back again so that happens for me that happens when I'm doing stranded work the most my yarn sometimes depending on how well it's been spun together that can happen too all right well so that's that's the only thing i can think of before you start to knit mm -hmm. is is um either unwind the whole ball and rewind it again um but 
or if you can't do that, then do a reverse stitch instead of doing um, over, under and over, do over and under to make the stitch. All right, hopefully. using the continental met method. Yes, and Annie did mention, I did double check, continental knitting, so this seems Yes, to be so then doing over, um, um, instead of plucking, you do it the opposite way, and that can help with the twist as well. Okay, and our final little clarification coming in from Jody here. So this was our blocking question that we talked about. Jody is making dishcloths, coasters, and a few table toppers and a scarf. A few amigurumi, but she knows that's different. Uh, so that was kind of where she was coming from with the blocking. Do you have anything to add with that additional context? The coasters I would block. Okay. Um, the scarf I definitely would block. Because sometimes, depending on what the stitch, um, whatever stitch she's used, the sides can can turn in. Mm -hmm. And so when you wet block and pin it when you're drying it, that really helps the scarf from starting to curl in. All right. Now we're going to move away, as promised, from our crocheting and knitting questions. For just a moment, we're going to take advantage of your wide breadth of crafting knowledge. And Baker has a question about your favorite type of paint. I'm still trying to find my favorite. I've tried acrylic paint and watercolor, but watercolor is pretty difficult. So what do you think? What are your favorites? Watercolor. <laughs> <laughs> um, watercolor and oil. Um, acrylic, I, I'm really not fond of because it dries so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that the pigments can sometimes lose their, they're not as, as bright. Um, oil, I love oil, but sometimes I get frustrated with the amount of time it takes to, to cure and, and dry. However, the one amazing thing about about um, oils is that you can really go back and correct mistakes, which is not as easy in watercolor. Um, when I do watercolor, I usually do um, do it on dry. I don't do it on wet, so I don't wet before I do my watercolor. Um, but you know, one of the biggest things about painting is there's nothing that is wrong so you know don't be too harsh on yourself because you have to start somewhere and and with watercolors people are always saying oh my gosh it's too difficult it's this and that and the other but it's not it really isn't it's a question of just being kind to yourself and the other um thing is use the best type of 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 paint that you can afford. Mm -hmm. So if I would not go with, um, you know, the Hobby Lobby 10 for, for $19.99 watercolor, because you will be disappointed. Um, not only that, it'll um, fade over time. If you go with Daniel Smith or um, any of the good watercolor paints, you'll have a lot more success and just practice and there's no wrong way just it's like anything you know when you start knitting you don't suddenly make this amazing lace shawl you have to start somewhere <laughs> so the key really is practice practice um but my two favorite mediums are definitely um oil and watercolor I did a lot of oil in the past, but I'm I'm more into watercolor now because it's quicker. Simply that for me is the only reason is it's it's quicker. All right. Well, after that brief pit stop at paint, we're going to go back into yarn based crafts. Um, I'm going to do Miriam's question first, and then we have a couple beginner questions that have popped in. Uh, so Miriam wants to know first, do you knit and crochet? And also, do you make animals? Yes, and yes, and yes. <laughs> I do. Um, I, with crochet, I had a lot of fun with my child when he was small, because he would, he would order his animals. So he would say to me, oh, mom, can you make me a whatever? Um, the last one, uh, he 
ordered was a T-Rex. <laughs> now he's 11 and that was a few years ago, but so yes. And then for knitting, um, I went through a phase of, of making teddy bears for everyone and making mini clothes. So when my, um, my friend had a baby, the gift I gave her was a teddy bear for the baby. And then for every birthday, I would make a set of clothes for the teddy bear. Awesome. So, and then I've knitted, I've knitted and crocheted um, our dogs. So we have a Labrador and two, we don't know what they are. <laughs> so I've, I had fun with those. All right. And Miriam also is curious about what your favorite kind of yarn is. Oh, my heart is in New Zealand. <laughs> I love the, um, really, my favorite yarn of all time has to be the merino possum yarns that you can get in, in Australia and in, in New Zealand. They just are so warm. The, they don't, you don't overheat. They're not scratchy. Um, and they are just so beautiful. They leave the most beautiful loft. I mean, it's just, um, I also love, um, if I'm going to be doing, you know, summer, summer um, projects, I like um, cotton silk blends and linen, linen silk blends. I, I don't have a preferred, manufacturer i do like a lot of the rowan yarns um simply because they have such a an array of colors and and i love how they look when you do color work but i'm very much a if i see the yarn and i touch it and i love it i don't care where it came from <laughs> I, I tend not to go for big box store yarns because i really I'm very, very much um, a proponent of buying my yarn local or from your local yarn store. So I, I wouldn't, unless I have a specific project that requires um, me to, to, to buy one of those big balls from Walmart, I, I, I generally wouldn't. Um, you can find some, re you know, reasonable, same price range yarns in your local yarn store. And so um, that's, I don't know if that answered the question, but I'm not really a brand person when it comes to yarn. <laughs> it's more to do with how it feels, how it looks, the color, um, texture. I think that's very fair. Uh, and anybody else that has a favorite yarn, drop that into the chat as well uh, so we can see what kind of yarn you all are working with. Uh, we're going to move into, as promised, we have two questions coming in from beginners. The first is a knitting beginner. Mm -hmm. So this is coming in from Ada, and Ada's new to knitting. And she says, can you tell me why I've seen small pins and the rows go on? Does this mean it's to show where you stop or start a new row and then you take this out? Uh, what are these called and how are they used? I think you're referring to stitch markers. Yes, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm doing a complex pattern, um, so let me see, I've got, so here, I think this is what you mean, stitch markers. Mm -hmm. So these, I use stitch markers to hold a stitch so that it doesn't run. Also, if I'm doing a more complex pattern like this one, which is a 12 stitch repeat, I like to put a marker after each 12 stitch repeat. That way it's easier for me to memorize the pattern or to see if I've made a mistake when I'm knitting. Um, so stitch marker, um, stitch markers are um, very, very useful. I also um, like when I'm, when I'm making a crochet pattern, I like to know where I started decreasing because it's not as easy to see in a, in a crochet 
So I like to put a stitch marker where I started decreasing so I can see how many decreases I had. Um, really, stitch markers are invaluable. They serve many purposes. <laughs> and there's some beautiful ones out there. I was just going to mention, you can find some really, really bright colored ones, all kinds of different uh, types for people that yes. are using them. All right, let's go to our next beginner question. And this one is a beginner new at crocheting. So this is Nancy. And Nancy has problems knowing which weight yarn that she needs to use. Is there a table that you can point her to somewhere? Uh, what do you think? Most patterns will tell you mm -hmm. what weight and what hook to use. Um, there are lots and I mean dozens of of places where online where you can um, even on Craftsy um, you can just do a search and it'll tell you what hook to use with what weight yarn. So I for instance if I'm using a DK I would more often than not use a four millimeter or 4.5 seven depending on who, what sort of, so a 7.5. This, this for me is my favorite for a DK weight. So a not, not too thick yarn, an iron weight, DK weight. I would use a 7.5, 4.5 millimeter um, O hook. Um, for a worsted, I would go higher. So the thicker the yarn, the larger the hook. Now, remember, um, I mentioned that gauge is everything when you're making either a knitted garment or a crocheted garment. So you really have to pay attention. I have never made anything without making a swatch first. Ever. I have a box about this big full of swatches. Um, and what I do with those swatches to come to our um, piecing question, whether they're crochet or knitted, I will make a big blanket every year, every couple of years. I will make a series of blankets using all those swatches and donate them to the hospital. So it's. Um, the swatches really are the key to knowing what hook or what size yarn to use. Generally speaking, if you choose your yarn like I do, I choose my yarn first. If it doesn't fit into the gauge that is written on the pattern, I will either go up um, a hook or go down a hook. So that is really how you decide. Um, on which size yarn or hook to use. Okay, before I ask our next question, a quick reminder from me, time always flies when we do these crafty chats. We are nearing the end of our time together. So if you've been oh hanging God. on to a question, now is the time to drop it into the chat box so that we can get to it for today's session. Don't worry, we always come back for more later. Uh, but for today, we're closing in on the end of our time. Uh, so drop your last questions in. And in the meantime, uh, Carla wants to know, Natalie, when you mentioned DK weight, what are you talking about? Can you Double knit. I'm sorry. Double <laughs> knit. So you have lace, um, lace weight, fingering, um, sport, double knit or iron, worsted. I've probably missed one along the way, but it's, it's the thickness of yarn. And it's three ply usually. So three ply means it has, when you go like this, it has three strands in it. Uh huh. So, oops, I'm trying to divide the yarn without much success. But you'll see there are three strands. Mm -hmm. So that would be three ply yarn. And that's usually a double knit. And then two ply yarn, which is fingering, would have two strands and then the lace would have one strand so that's just a quick so this would be a fingering weight that has two two strands that are spun together and then the next one up 
would be the decay, it has three. All right. And Thank depending you. On, on the worsted, you can have different amounts, but that's kind of a, a very basic and not always true <laughs> statement. But, you know, when they talk about two ply, three ply, that's what they mean. All right. Uh, that is very helpful. We clearly have some beginners watching today. So thank you for clarifying. Uh, do you want to point out some of the crowdsourcing that I mentioned is happening? We've got Evelyn's suggestion for yarn. Cascade 220 is a good yarn for Evelyn. And yes. then um, we have- I love Cascade 220. Ah, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So then we have Elation Relation that has dropped in a little comment about the twisty yarn and how they deal with it as well. So if you are interested in that, go ahead in the chat box and check out some of the crowdsourcing that we have going on. Uh, we also have a question that just dropped in. Uh, this is also from Tyson. So Natalie, Tyson is knitting trigger mitts from Newfoundland. Have you ever heard of them before? Trigger mitts. Hmm. No, I have not. <laughs> uh, you know, when I think trigger, I live in Arizona, so it's, you know, everybody seems to walk around with, I live like really in the desert with farmers <laughs> everywhere. And um, trigger mitts, I'm wondering, is that what it is where your finger? Tyson, let us know. Uh Clearly, Natalie has not heard of these before. No, I have not. Or maybe so, I, I might note under a Perhaps. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on and see if anything comes in last minute on that. But also, Natalie, I wanted a chance to ask you. I know we talked a little bit right before we were going live about all of the different crafts that it is that you have undertaken and you kind of cover a wide breadth of crafting. Uh, for anybody out there that maybe is just a knitter, maybe just does sewing that is considering branching out into something else, I was wondering if you talk a little bit about getting started on that next craft adventure and how that feels and any suggestions you would have for somebody that's looking to branch out. Whenever yeah. I've branched out, it's usually been because I've seen something that has triggered something passionate in me. Mm -hmm. So um, I, of course, Pinterest just comes up constantly with with these new crafting ideas and and but really a good place is if you go to your local farmers market or if there's a fall fair or a spring fair you always have crafters from every walks of life so you'll have knitters you'll have crochets you'll have pottery you'll have photography and i often get inspired by seeing somebody else's masterpiece and say, oh my gosh, I would love to learn that. Or if a friend of mine, and that's often the case too, is a friend of mine starts something new and she says, have you tried this? No, I haven't. We get together and we have a cup of coffee and we try a new craft. So that's how I have started on different um, avenues. The painting, um, is from more from my parents, both my parents paint. So we always had that in our family. My dad was always painting. My mom was always painting. So um, that was me doodling beside them. <laughs> and I've never reached their talent, but I still love to do it. <laughs> All right. So find some inspiration and let that guide you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take Isabel's question as our last question today. Uh, it's another new knitter. Um, and I think it's a great question specific to Isabel, but probably could help all of us that are starting out new. Uh, so Isabel says, I am a new knitter. I am blind. I have to find creative ways to hide mistakes. Do you have any ideas? I will tell you a little secret. Now everybody knows it. <laughs> I always leave a mistake in every single piece that I knit or crochet. Always. Because it's kind of, to me, it's a reminder that nothing needs to be perfect. So I don't know if you sew, but very often 
sewing or attaching something, like if you made a scarf, you can sew on a button to hide mm. the mistake. Or you can, um, there, there are many ways, but mistakes, I think, enhance the piece. And I, as I said, leave always leave one mistake. And I tell, everybody says, okay, where's your mistake? And sometimes they're really easy to see. Other times <laughs> they're not. But using a button um, or sewing a little flower, if it's, you know, something that you find um, easy to do, um, those would be my suggestion. All right. Well, that being said, that does wrap up our time. Um, before I give you the floor for some final thoughts, Tyson did let us know what the trigger mitts are. It sounds like you were onto something. They're the mittens that three fingers. So these three fingers would be in the mitten. There's a finger for the pointer and a finger for the thumb. So it looks like uh, Tyson said there's a book called Saltwater Mittens from the Island of Newfoundland. And there are 20 oh. heritage mittens to knit from there. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, those, um, my grandmother made mittens or gloves like that for my grandfather for when he went fishing. Ah, all right. So he could use the finger. Yes. To cast the cast the line all so, right <laughs> you you're on the right track okay well this is the time that you have i always love to give you the opportunity when we finish um our our guests to see where we can find you what you're working on in the near future and any reminders you want to leave us with before we have to say farewell so the floor is yours natalie uh let us know where we can find you next well i will be um on craftsy in espanol tomorrow mm -hmm. so um at 12 1 p.m central i believe it is um i as i said i've just started on this platform i do not have a website anymore we had the website the yarn sisters but of course <laughs> when uh the company when we sold the company we no longer had the website I will be having uh, setting up a website soon, and it's probably going to be just natalieoshea.com. Um, and just, you know, when you're making something, remember that, as I said, mistakes happen. And if you have to rip something off or you get frustrated, put it aside, try something else, and come back to it. Don't be a perfectionist because you're making something with love and you're human so mistakes are good and they're fine so try it don't give up practice makes perfect and enjoy if it becomes tedious then try something else <laughs> Oh, what a fantastic piece of advice to leave us on today. Uh, so I have to say thank you to Natalie for all of your expertise and answering all of these questions today. Uh, a couple farewell reminders from me. If you even if you haven't asked a question, I encourage you to scroll through the chat box. Our team has dropped some fantastic links, including the link to last week's mini series, our cozy craft along. If you're looking to branch out into other crafts, if you are a beginner, a lot of those patterns and projects are very beginner friendly. Uh, so check that out. And of course, some other links are in there as well. That being said, it is time to say farewell for this Craftsy Chats, but we always come back with more. So keep an eye for the next Craftsy Chat. We would love to have you back again. Until the next time, on behalf of our entire team, Natalie and myself, Leah, I'd say thank you for joining us today. And until next time, happy crafting. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. <laughs>